You're watching Truth vs. Hype. This week we broke a story on how an American forensic firm, Arsenal Consulting, found scores of incriminating documents planted on the computer of the activist Father Stan Swamy by an unknown attacker. The same documents which were used to charge the activist priest under stringent anti-terror laws in what's known as the Bhima Koregaon case. Now the charges against Swami had always been viewed with great skepticism given his record of service to tribals and marginalized communities. His death last year while still in custody had drawn global condemnation. The European Union's special representative for human rights had said he was very saddened to hear that Father Stan Swami had passed away. The UN special rapporteur on human rights defenders went as far as to say that the priest had been arrested on quote false charges of terrorism and that there is no reason human rights defenders should ever die the way Father Swami died, accused and detained and denied his rights. Swami himself in a video statement recorded just days before his arrest had said that the so-called Maoist letters found on his computer were bogus. I was interrogated for 15 hours during a span of five days. They started to put before me certain extracts um, supposedly taken from my computer. Hmm? Extracts which were, you know, Maoists were communicating with each other. Hmm? And in some extracts even my name was mentioned. Hmm? So they said, um, where did he meet? My first question was, who is the person writing? To whom was it written? Hmm? On which date it is written? Is there a signature to what is written? None of it was there. So these uh, extracts were all interpolations hmm? uh, uh, put into my computer. So I took that stance uh, very clearly. The Arsenal report appears to bear out these claims, opening up a minefield of questions whether the activist's arrest in 2020 at the age of 83 and his death a year later was on the basis of fabricated evidence. Given that Arsenal had found the same modus operandi in their analysis of the devices of two other accused in the same high-profile Bhima Koregaon case, Surendra Gadling and Rona Wilson, of planting incriminating documents, there's now a serious question mark over the entire case, which has seen over a dozen activists, human rights defenders and academics jailed on terror charges. Remember, these questions of exaggerated, even false allegations of Maoist conspiracies to target those considered to be critics of the Modi government have haunted the Bhima Koregaon case from the start. To recap, in January 2018, riots had broken out in the town of Bhima Koregaon between Dalits and the upper caste Maratha community during an annual event held to mark the victory of a Dalit contingent of the British Army over the Maratha forces in the 19th century. From initial accounts, it appeared that the provocation came from the Maratha side and FIR was registered against two right-wing Maratha activists, Milind Ekbote and Sambhaji Bhide, for reportedly inciting the Marathas to attack the Dalits, sparking the riots. But within a matter of months, the police blamed a gathering held a day before the riots called the Elga Parishad for instigating the violence in tandem with Maoists. This gathering was attended in addition to Dalit activists like Jignesh Mewani and the Bhim Army's Chandrasekhar by prominent civil society figures like former Judge Kolse Patil and the student activist Umar Khalid all well-known critics of the BJP RSS. While a bulk of the speeches with their anti-caste theme were directed against targeting Hindutva and the RSS, there appeared to be little or no evidence of incitement to violence or Maoist sloganeering. In fact, this grainy video shows the group swearing allegiance to the Indian constitution. And yet, the investigating agencies, first the Maharashtra police and then the NIA pushed ahead, targeting not just linked to Elgar Parishad, but bewilderingly cast their net nationwide, picking up a wide swath 
of left-leaning activists and human rights defenders over the course of two years, including those who not even attended the Elgar Parishad. Amongst those picked up, human rights lawyer Surendra Gardling arrested from Nagpur, activist Rona Wilson from Delhi, trade unionist and activist Vernon Gonzalez from Mumbai, activist Varavara Rao from Hyderabad, human rights lawyer Sudha Bharadwaj, who is based in Chhattisgarh, picked up in Faridabad, the academic Anand Teltumbre from Mumbai, and finally Father Stan Swami from Ranchi. Now these arrests triggered a firestorm of criticism, with many alleging that the government was simply going after BJP RSS critics or those linked to tribal and Dalit communities doing activism that posed a threat to mobilization by Hindutva outfits in those areas and communities or who are challenging the excesses of the Indian state. At the same time, the investigators went far easier on Ek Bote and Bhide, the right-wing Maratha activists considered close to the BJP. The Pune police dropped Bhide's name entirely from their charge sheet filed in September of last year, saying there wasn't enough evidence against him. Ek Bote, while named in the charge sheet, remains out on bail. Moreover, it was argued by the activists that many of those arrested like Stan Swami or Sudha Bharadwaj appeared to bear no direct connection to the violence outside Pune, had neither even attended the Elgar Parishad event, supposed to be the catalyst to the riots. But the government claimed the focus went beyond just Bhima Koregao. They claimed they had damning evidence that linked this group of activists to Maoist plots to stage violent attacks and even kill the Prime Minister. The proof? Essentially letters between the activists and Maoists, which the agencies claim they found on the activists' computers. Letters which contained exchanges like this. This undated letter from Comrade Sudha to Comrade Prakash, where the alleged Naxals used the full names of other alleged Naxals. Comrade Gautam Navlakha, Comrade Arun Ferreira, Comrade Stan Swami and so on. In another letter dated 18 April 2017, again from R to Comrade Prakash, an account of a plot to kill the Prime Minister is laid out in extensive detail, with R saying Comrade Kisan and few other senior comrades have proposed concrete steps to end Modi Raj. We're thinking along the lines of another Rajiv Gandhi type incident. It sounds suicidal and there is a chance that we might fail. The letters prompted deep scepticism from security experts. Listen to what Ajay Sani, who studies counterinsurgency, told us in 2018 of how unlikely it would be for secrecy-obsessed groups like the Maoists to write such letters. We could just start off by saying yes. that, frankly, even if four little 15-year-old uh, boys got together hmm. to conspire on their first crime, right. do you think they would be writing li uh, to each other like this? So this business I of... Mean, of this whole, whole, whole uh, fabric, uh, obvious and evident fabrication. The other thing is the selective identification of individuals who are anti-state, anti-government or, or thought of as being, you know, uh, I have said this before but I uh, just uh, repeat it. Today, if you oppose the government hmm. or you oppose this particular ideology, yes. you are either a Ma Maowadi or you are a Jihadi. This skepticism has now snowballed into a full-scale controversy after the legal team of some of the accused hired Arsenal Consulting to analyze the hard drives of their clients. The original drives were seized by the police, but as per law, the police is meant to share a mirror image of the drive with the defendants, which in turn was passed on to Arsenal. In its initial reports in early 2021, Arsenal's analysis of Rona Wilson's drive found that over 30 documents were planted on his device. In July 2021, their analysis of the computer of Surindra Gardling had been compromised and at least 14 incriminating letters were planted on his system. And now the findings from Stan Swami's hard drive, the hacking of which, according to Arsenal, was even more invasive than the others. You're saying you, that this is the most invasive kind of surveillance you've come across? That's correct. Um, and we have never heard of a case involving the, the targeting of individuals, the compromise of individuals uh, over the course of this many years uh, and ultimately culminating in the delivery of documents 
to multiple uh, targets computers. Again, over the course of years. Uh, it's, it's just not something we've ever heard of, never mind been involved in ourselves. The 25-page Arsenal report spells out in great technical detail how the attack on Swami's device was the most severe yet. In October 2014, the hacker gained access to Stan Swami's computer using a malware called Netwire and then was able to conduct intensive surveillance over Stan Swami's computer use as well as deliver or plant a series of documents on his device. These documents were planted in a hidden folder called My Data similar to how the hacker had used hidden folders to deliver documents on the systems of other accused, like Wilson and Gadling. The folder was created on July 20, 2017, and multiple documents were delivered to his system over the course of two different campaigns, till about June 5, 2019. In all, Arsenal said, around 44 documents were planted on Father Stan Swamy's computer including incriminating Maoist-linked documents. According to Arsenal, one such document delivered by the attacker to Stan Swamy's computer and part of the NIA's charge sheet against the priest was an alleged letter sent by one SS, presumed to be Father Stan Swamy, to a Vijayan Dada on October 2017. In the letter, SS asks Vijayan to take action to capture senior leaders of the ruling BJP in the state and demand that the oppressive laws be done away with. This, says Arsenal, was planted. Another document in the NIA charge sheet against Swami, detailing the manpower and weaponry of a Maoist outfit called People's Liberation Guerrilla Army in different Indian states, is also among the planted documents. According to Arsenal, they found no evidence which would suggest that the documents were ever interacted with in any legitimate way or ever even opened on Father Swami's computer. This bolsters the priest's repeated claims that he had nothing to do with these documents. The big unanswered question in all this is, of course, who could have been behind the hacking? Over the course of three reports, Arsenal has not speculated on the identity of the attacker. Father Stan Swami was raided and his computer was seized on June 12, 2019. A day before this, on June 11, 2019, the attacker attempted to delete traces of their activities on the computer, raising questions as to whether they had prior knowledge of the police raid the next day. You've not identified the attacker, is that correct? Because even in previous reports, you've not identified the attacker. Uh, That's correct. Okay, and, and again, just to understand for the benefit of our viewers, that's because the attacker's identity is, is not clear through the available evidence or you've just decided to withhold it because, you know, for wh whatever reason, you may, not feel, you may feel there's not enough information or for any other reason? We don't think it's appropriate for us to speculate uh, about the identity of the attacker. Um, we feel very strongly that the Indian government has the resources and the authority hmm. to do this. Um, and it's, it's more appropriate for the Indian government to identify the attacker. But, uh, you know, given the, the sort of nature of the software used or whatever the hacking technology used, is it possible for a government to identify the attacker? Yes. Okay. Short answer, yes, you're saying it is possible, uh, but you're saying no one has approached you and, and from our side, we've of course not heard anything from the Indian government about whether they're even getting into this. But I want to come back to that, that, that while you don't identify the attacker, it's interesting that you point out that in your findings, the attacker was almost frantically trying to clean up traces of their presence on the device. This was just the day before he was raided, almost as if there was a premonition that, you know, something was going to happen. Right. I won't speculate as to why the attacker was involved in this activity. Um, but what I can tell you is exactly what was occurring, what they were doing. Okay. Uh, and I know that the next day the computer was seized. Right. And, and what they were doing, as you, as you pointed out, was just basically, like to put it in simple terms, just deleting uh, their presence there? Uh, they were deleting evidence of the malicious activity. 
um, over time, but also creating noise by moving innocuous or benign files, thousands of files, in between uh, folders which had previously been used in a malicious way. So right. not just deleting, but also creating this, this effect of noise. This only bolsters the suspicions that the activists have had all along, that it's the Indian state behind the attacks. Now, while there's been no conclusive proof of this, some indications have come from other reports. In June of this year, Wired magazine reported that the Pune police were linked to the hacking campaign to frame these activists. This after a US-based cyber security outfit, Sentinel-1, found that the recovery email accounts of three of the accused that had been hacked included the full name of a police official in Pune who is closely involved in the Bhima Koregaon case. While this is far from conclusive, what is however curious is that the NIA has not responded to these reports at all, given the gravity of the evidence that is emerging. You're saying all this information can be checked quite easily by any, like for example, our own investigating agencies uh, could check it out. Uh, number one. Number two, since because now you've already published several of these reports, have any of them ever approached you, our agencies? They have not. Uh, but your, your, the way you paraphrase, this, the, paraphrase the situation is, is correct. Uh, anyone can confirm our findings with access to the same electronic evidence. Uh, our, our reports, in a sense, are a roadmap for other digital forensics practitioners. You know, we've, right. we've, done, we've done the difficult work. So they can follow our reports and they can confirm the findings. But, but nobody from our, just to, just to reconfirm this, because no one from our investigating agencies has reached out to you over your previous reports. To me, no. NDTV wrote to the NIA requesting for comments on the findings of Arsenal but has not received a response so far. We tried to reach out to voices within the BJP for a reaction to all of this. Uh, no one was willing to speak to us. So I finally ended up speaking to PKD Nambiar, political analyst who supports the BJP and began by asking him that the fact, PKD, that the NIA has even now refused to respond to report after report, doesn't that only bolster the impression that this entire Bhima Koregao case is a political act of vendetta. Srinivasan, and you are believing it. That is the irony. A private lab, you are ready to believe a private lab, which may have their own vested interests, and we are ready to believe, and we wanted uh, the government of India to answer to those questions. That's amazing. Remember that couple of months ago, when we, both of us, even in multiple channel discussions, we were talking about Pegasus. It was based on a private lab from US. They wanted, they, they, they questioned that it was, snooping into the politicos and the opposition leaders and journalists and what happened in the, when the, the Supreme Court committee has clearly said it is a white lie. Sorry, I don't think that the Supreme Court panel said that Pegasus is a white lie, but coming back to what you were saying about believing a US lab, I don't think it's a question of me or anybody else believing or not believing. The simple question is that this has come out multiple times. What is preventing our investigating agencies from looking into it? No, no, I, I believe that these selective uh, planting of stories and these reports coming from the, 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 I don't even give any credibility to such kind of agencies who comes up every second day. I also feel that it is maybe even these reports may be a part of the deep uh, states of the Western uh, uh, the countries. It could be US or any other country. So uh, rather than we become a part of that uh, uh, kind of a, a media trial, doing a media trial, we should leave it to the courts and we should believe in our court. And this, in this case, Bhima Koregao case, we, I, I am of the opinion, there is a trial is already on. The agencies are not NIA or a CBI or for that matter, any state police is not answerable to you and me, but to the court when the trial is on. Also joined on the show by Mihir Desai, who's been a lawyer for uh, the Bhima Koregao accused. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Mr. Desai for joining us. Now tell us, uh, the question that's being raised is, all these different reports have come out, do they have any evidentiary value in a court of law? And if so, uh, why have we not seen, despite all these reports coming out, the court taking some kind of action based on these reports? Uh, see, according to me, they would have 
evidentiary value. Uh, the only question is whether they would have evidentiary value today or at the time of trial. Because ordinarily, this is what is known as the defense evidence, what, what we are producing hmm. in terms of the reports. So this is a defense evidence. And defense evidence is ordinarily entertained at the time of trial. So evidentiary value definitely would be there. But whether it should be today or at the time of trial, and we are insisting, hmm. and already two petitions are filed in the high, uh, in the Bombay High Court, we are saying that looking at the gross nature of the evidence and the fact that this is the only evidence, okay, uh, you have to look at the evidentiary value of these, these documents today itself. Because trial may take 8 years, 10 years, 5 years, we don't know how long it will take. Okay, okay so in so, simple terms, what you're saying is that based on these arsenal reports, there are already petitions in the courts. These yes, are petitions there are, there are, filed by some of the accused. Yes, there are there are two petitions. One is filed on behalf of Rona Wilson, and the other is filed on behalf of Shoma Sen. Rona Wilson is the person from whose computer things were uh, uh, recovered. Hmm. Uh, Shoma Sen is the person against whom charges are made on the basis of recovery from Rona Wilson's computer. Right. So both both depend on uh, you know these uh, these these uh, documents which are reco allegedly recovered from their computer. So so these petitions are filed and what are they asking for? They are saying don't wait for trial. Uh, do what? Strike the okay. strike yeah, down so the they, charges they, against they, us or yeah, quash the charges. In the meantime, grant bail, quash the charge, quash the charges altogether, quash the sanction order because you see UAPA you can't invoke without a sanction. You okay, can't take so, cognizance without, uh, without a sanction. So okay, quash the, sanction. the charges and also the sanction, but have the courts responded to this? Well, then, well then it should come up in January. That's what we are anticipating, that both, both these matters will come up in January. Okay, And at that time, we will know how the court reacts to it. Because this is a unique case in a sense. So to, it's very difficult to predict how the court will look at it. So we, we are hopeful that the court will look at it in the a, uh, in a right way. With the NIA silent on the reports and the courts yet to act, the jail time extends for these activists and so do the risks, not just to freedom and reputation. Some like Stan Swami as we know have literally lost their lives. Others like Varavara Rao came close to the brink, his health so poor he was finally given medical bail. A few have finally started to get bail with conditions like Sudha Bharadwaj and Anand Teltumbre. The filmmaker Gautam Navlakha is out of jail but in house arrest with his freedoms curtailed. The remaining dozen or so activists though remain firmly behind bars even as evidence mounts that they may have been imprisoned on fabricated proof. All of this while the original accused for inciting the Bhima Karagaon violence remain at large. <laughs>